I have come to worship the God of wonders And I am here to drink from the stream of El Shaddai I have come to listen to my Creator And I am here to lift up the name of Jesus Christ yeah. You search and you find peace in Him. And if you search and you find true love from Him, let's give Him our heart, let's give Him our breath, let's take time to thank Him for dying our death. Let's give Him our voice, let's lift up our hands, let's give Him our life, let's surrender to Him. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for being with us as we gather and we dwell in the presence of the Lord as we are strengthened body, mind, and spirit for the week ahead. I'm the Reverend Deb Olenek, and this is the United Methodist Church of Evergreen, Colorado. Thank you for being here for worship. We have uh, gone to a stricter COVID level this week here in Jefferson County. It's meant some changes here for our ministry. For what is happening with our children's and youth ministry, please be sure to read the emails that Sarah sends out. And if you need more information, give us a call. Also, the other on-site activities during the week will be moved to Zoom. Jessica will have office hours this week and then she will be re, um, remotely working from home because of the change of what's happening for our schools. And I'm primarily working remotely from home, but believe me, Jessica and I are still very much available by email, by phone, or by text. Now we have our Christmas toy boxes here in Fellowship Hall. And what that means is we are receiving new unwrapped, unwrapped toys. And they will then be distributed by either Evergreen Christian Outreach or Mountain Resource Centers. So please plan to bring those in sometimes in the next two weeks. Again, on Sunday mornings is best, even if you're not able to stay for on-site worship. Also, this morning until noon and next Sunday morning, we are receiving household items and furniture in good shape. This is as we help to supply some new apartments which are opening for veterans. We do have our Advent devotionals, which are in those daily devotionals. If you'd like to have one, again, try to pick them up on Sunday morning or let us know and we can mail them to you. Nathan still has a couple more weeks in which he's recording. Those of you who would like to be part of a virtual choir singing Silent Night, please be in touch with him. A week from tomorrow is when our Advent Zoom study will begin 7 p.m. on Monday evenings. Uh, contact us if you'd like to be a part of that. And now, may we listen to Karen as we get into a spirit of worship.
please join with me in prayer. God of fall and winter, God of spring and summer, you know the seasons of our lives. Let the season of darkness and doubt pass away, that we may be reborn in your light. Lead us into a season of light and warmth, a season of wisdom, compassion, gratitude, and strength, a season where all your children clothe themselves with faith and hope in the midst of whatever weighs them and us down. Fill us, gracious God, with a sense of your abiding presence. Awaken our spirits to realities unseen. Turn us from our fears and help us to live with trust in you. Expand among us such mutual regard and encouragement as will build up community and lead all of us to live in the light. May faith and love dominate all our relationships as we enter into the joy of serving in the name of Christ. We lift up our health care heroes, so many of them, and our hospitals at their limits. Keeps, keep us mindful of the importance of our own safe practices at all times. Help heal those who are suffering from COVID. And we lift up those who have lost their lives this week to this disease. We also lift up their loved ones. We lift up all who are in need this day. May your power and grace give them healing, hope, and relief from the struggles of their lives. As we join in the prayer our Lord taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We turn now to our gospel reading, which is the same as last week, coming from Luke chapter 14, verses 27 to 32. Hear these words. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King. Old Testament reading comes from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. These are the same words we heard last week. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. 
By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate in the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Instead of what was turning out to be a marathon sermon last week, I decided to break it into two parts. Those of you who were here last week know what I'm talking about. Those of you who weren't, you're going to catch on where we are at fairly easily. So this is part two of rebuilding. Now, I chose Nehemiah to give us scriptural guidance for where we as a nation and as individuals might rebuild out of the divisiveness that is around us. Nehemiah came from Babylon being urged by God to go to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls of that holy city. As you know, we have the same scripture passages as last week, but we have some additional understandings from this passage for what goes into rebuilding anything of importance. And this now we move right back in with Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem. So the first understanding for today is work effectively with all kinds of people in order to serve God, in order to reweave some of the fabric of our nation, which is a bit frayed, be it those of us here, or be it those at the highest level, we need to learn how to work effectively with all kinds of people. Nehemiah was sensitive 
to people and he responded to them with tact, but also when he needed, he brought uncompromising strength. There's three types of people that he dealt with in um, our part of his story. First, Nehemiah had to deal with an unbelieving king in Babylon. This was an especially difficult situation because the king being Nehemiah's direct boss, literally with the flick of a hand could have caused Nehemiah's head to roll. So to convince this Persian king to change his approach to Jerusalem was no easy task. However, Nehemiah, over time, had gained the king's respect through his competence on the job, his trustworthy character, and his loyalty. When we are working with people who might want to discount us, Remember, we need to take time so they get to know us and see that we're trustworthy and see our competence and also loyalty in the sense that we do care about their well-being and not just our own. Next were the demoralized citizens of Jerusalem. They believed in God's promises intellectually, but they had lost hope. They had tried to rebuild the wall, and they really didn't want an outsider coming in and telling them to do something that they knew could not be done. Some may even not have seen the need. Others would be warning, oh, if you try to rebuild the wall, you're only going to incur trouble with the surrounding governors. And there were a third group of difficult people, ones we would have met in verses right before our passage and verses right after our passage. These are the ones who opposed the whole endeavor. They didn't want a fortified Jerusalem because it would threaten their political positions. They didn't care about the plight of the average Jew, much less about the name of the Lord being exalted in Jerusalem. So they were displeased. They joined together to ridicule the project. With these people, Nehemiah sensed that diplomacy would not work. So he clearly drew the line between them and God's people so that they couldn't join the project with the goal of sabotaging it. Second understanding for today, convince others to share the pride and the passion. As we talked about last week, Nehemiah made a proper survey with a few others and evaluated the work to be done. Then, then Nehemiah called a meeting of those uh, surrounding Jerusalem. He called together officials, priests, nobles, but also workers who would be doing the work. In verse 17, Nehemiah says to them, you see the trouble we are in Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Nehemiah also told them about the gracious hand of God being upon him and what the king had done. Now, this message um, was a masterful work of simplicity and directness. And I want you to note four elements of it. One, his personal sense of identification with them. Second, an acknowledgment of Jerusalem's plight. Third, an appeal to specific action. And fourth, that he was willing to be a witness that it was about what God was calling him and the people to do. Nehemiah not only himself had the desire to see this work done, but he also had the desire to convince others that they should be just as passionate about it. Notice how Nehemiah includes himself as one of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, even though this was his very first time there. He didn't play the role of a visiting official saying, you people are in a mess and 
I have come to help you. Rather, he said, you see the bad situation we are in? He makes it known that he is one of them. They are in the mess together. He didn't sugarcoat things. Difficulties must be faced realistically, not just with a lot of rhetoric and empty promises. And this is what Jesus is teaching us in our passage from Luke, as we talked about last week. Count the cost. Know the best way to go about things. Be ready to deal with problems and obstacles and sacrifice. Nehemiah pointed out that this situation carried with it disgrace. The Jews that had lived there a long time had been living with this disgrace, and they probably it was probably second nature to them now. And in some ways, that is where I think we are at in our country around the divisiveness that we have seen over these past many years. Nehemiah stirred up in the people a healthy sense of pride and reignited the desire to get rid of the disgrace. He called them then to action, to get back, to work to rebuild the wall, even though they had given up on doing so many years beforehand. And then Nehemiah was willing to put himself out there, his faith out there about the power of God and the necessity of turning to God moving forward. These people in Jerusalem were a broken people, but I'm sure they listened with wonder when they heard the way in which the heathen king had supplied letters of authority and even supplies and the power with which Nehemiah talked about the king's action as well as God's hand being present. He knew he needed the help of God's people to be successful. Winston Churchill became prime minister of Great Britain right in the middle of World War II, and he spoke these words in his very first speech. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, sweat. What is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory, in spite of all terror, however long and hard the road may be. You might remember studying about that speech. Well, Nehemiah was just as inspiring in his first speech in Jerusalem. He galvanizes the Jews to action to begin the process of rebuilding. He appeals to their sense of self-respect and supplies encouraging motives. Third understanding, cast a vision which connects with the people. Casting a vision is critically important if people are going to have any chance of achieving a future goal. First, you have to understand your own purpose, and then you can bring that vision to those around you. Without a vision, says one of the more famous verses in Proverbs, the people will perish. Remember Walt Disney? He was one of the most visionary people in American history, making groundbreaking movies, taking animation to never before imagined heights, and of course, creating Disneyland in California and Disney World in Florida. When Disney World first opened, Mrs. Walt Disney was asked to speak at the grand opening because Walt Disney had passed on. She was introduced. She was introduced by someone who said, Mrs. Disney, I just wish Walt could have been here to see this. Her speech, well, she had just heard someone say to her and to everyone else gathered, I wish Walt could have seen this. So Mrs. Disney stood up and said, he did. And that was her speech. And she sat back down. 
for Walt Disney had already enjoyed Disney World through his vision of it, though he wasn't alive when the gates were opened for the first time. Four, set aside an independent spirit to work together. If we were to jump ahead to chapter 3 in Nehemiah's story, we would see that he divided the work among 42 groups. Each group was committed to their particular task and to getting that accomplished, but they also understood the big picture and thereby were not jealous of what one another was doing. They knew they needed one another, so they appreciated each other for the work they were able to contribute. There was not the priority of an independent spirit among the people who responded to Nehemiah's call. They knew their strength would come from their unity. The minute our vision changes from God's purposes to our own private work, our strength is gone. Five, claim a unity of purpose. For our nation, with God's help, we will need to discover and claim some kind of unity of vision, no matter what our political persuasion. For if there is no unity of vision, there will be no unity of purpose. Nehemiah was able to translate the vision. Therefore, they all had the same purpose, to rebuild the walls to God's glory. Let me wrap up with this. I believe we need to go forth for our nation being as encouraging and as visionary and as passionate as we each can be, no matter what the state of the walls of our Jerusalem. We need each other for this. We all need many, many people. Whatever the state of the walls of our own Jerusalem, it took more than one year and more than just a few people for them to be in the state they are in, and it will take more than one year and more than just a few people for them to be rebuilt. So let's start rebuilding. And here's a few questions to ponder in the week ahead. What can we do about the obstacles holding back the values of Christ's gospel being front and center for our nation? What steps would you advise for someone who does not work well with people in order for them to acquire this essential skill? And how can we guard ourselves against disappointment and cynicism when Things do not match our expectations as we seek to serve the Lord. Amen.
When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done All my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time You're my life when I 